friends of the podcast world, welcome to NATO, the podcast. Welcome to NATO headquarters. My name is Benjamin Welling, and today we will talk a little bit more about the U.S., where things have started to uh, go upside down since last night. We have the sad news that Ruth Bader Ginsburg has died, um, who came to a very uh, high age but unfortunately just died uh, of cancer just now and our thoughts and prayers are with our family. Um, the situation has actually had impact on the national election debate. Uh, since it's a topic that will, that will come up now, um, the majority leader in the U.S. Senate, Mitch McConnell, has said that uh, the Senate will go ahead and try to reelect a new Supreme Court judge uh, under the guide of President Trump. And so uh, there will be some debate about that. We, will, we are going to talk about that today. I'm very happy to announce I have my good friend uh, Emmanuel Jensen with me here today again. Um, our personal uh, expert as a U.S. citizen <laughs> from the U.K., uh, always, always very uh, good, very well informed about things happening on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, you're up for it, Manny, today? Oh, totally up for it. Totally, totally up for it. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to introduce a new guest on the show, uh, Lukas Posch, uh, until recently national chairman of the Young Transatlantic Initiative, which is a, a national German youth club um, that's determined to bring Americans and Germans closer together on political topics, but also on cultural topics. So it's a group that tries to bring the transatlantic partnership uh, into every home, I think. Hi, Lukas. Nice to have you here. Hi, Benjamin. Thank you for the invitation. So, Lucas, um, what's the Young Transatlantic Initiative? Maybe you can say something on that. So, the Young Transatlantic Initiative is an organization that was founded in Germany with the aim of bringing Germans, Americans, and now also Canadians and other Europeans closer together, where we try to focus on German-American topics or topics of a transatlantic meaning in a general pro-American spin. That is not automatically in favor of the current government, be it um, President Obama or President Trump, but this is mainly trying to focus on discussions in a way that foster the German-American and European North American friendship. That means we discussed topics such as TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, um, we had seven years ago the discussion when um, it turned out that American intelligence agencies were probably wiretapping the phone of the fellow chancellor of Germany. But that also means that we try to just bring together people who might not automatically have the same opinion, but who have the same general stance, which is that America and Europe are of the same kind when it comes to political history, to philosophic history. Mm -hmm. Um, this is mainly trying to bring these people together and, and on one hand create a network of people. The organization has around about 600 members. And on the other hand, also to help them gain new knowledge by hosting discussions, by hosting study tours, by hosting uh, talks with U.S. representatives in Germany, for example, with the consuls general here in Germany, but also like once a year touring the United States and touring Canada. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, it's a German organization, or yeah, organiza organization that sits in Germany. Uh, but you're not German that much. You're a born Austrian. So exactly. how does yes, uh, an, an Austrian become in charge of the German-American relations youth organization? <laughs> and what's your personal relationship to the U.S.? Well, I have to say, first of all, obviously, I had spent 18 years to find my way out of the Austrian forests and into the German area. Um, <laughs> no, but basically, um, I was born in Austria. I grew up in Austria. And when I was 18, I um, left Austria to go to law school in Hamburg. And this is basically where I've been staying for the last around about seven years. I spent a year in the United States studying and working in Boston, Massachusetts. And yeah, what's there to say about my personal relationship to the United States? Um, frankly, I've always grown up in a very politicized household 
which I think is something that many people nowadays do not experience. Mm. And I think this is especially important with regards to Austria, because the Austrian-American relation, despite the fact that Austria profited even more per capita from the um, European Recovery Fund than Germany or any other country in continental Europe ever did, there's not that much of a gratitude or political tradition that Austrian politics and foreign policy is intertwined with American politics. This is probably because Austria always served this kind of hinge function between the East and the West. So um, Austria never joining NATO, um, Austria being one of these block-free countries mm. trying to um, be on good terms with the Soviet Union, but also in good terms with the United States. And this is basically where my personal experience comes from with the U.S. I think I've just been, I just grew up in a family that was always very much pro-American. Um, yeah. So I went to the U.S. for the first time as a child, and since then, the U.S. always seemed this the land of hope and glory for me. Even if it's not their anthem, it definitely is something <laughs> that I've always... Uh, yeah. I'm sure they wish it was. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you remember, I think it was John Winthrop who talked about the uh, shining city upon a hill. Yep. And every single time um, I come to the United States or talk about the United States, um, the ideal for me is always this shining city upon a hill, which yeah. it never, oh, it it never really is. But let's be frank: the shining city upon a hill is something that you try to reach. You can never really fully reach it, mm. but um, it's the motivation that many countries in Europe, I think, yeah, never yeah. really had. No, for sure. No, for sure. No, 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 no. Absolutely, for sure. I think that yeah, that 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 um that relationship between uh, the Germanic world and the American world is is what much underrated. You know, the degree to which the Midwest, electorally vital region, um, was affected in certainly in the early days by the politics of the German diaspora. There is a fascinating topic, but you know, for another very very underrated, uh, but also very interesting topic. But no, I think that when you when as it, as a I think the the big topic, obviously right now is uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and of course. I think I completely echo what Ben has to say is that, you know, lion of the Supreme Court, lion of American um, legal field, incredible woman, incredible trailblazer. And it's obviously a very sad day for uh, America to lose such a bright mind and such a, an important figure. Um, and it's rather grim, but immediately, of course, the discussion has turned to the political ramifications. And uh, that, that's something, you know, what, what do you think, Lucas? What, what's, let's survey the, the territory. Where are the, what are the ramifications? Well, let's, let's, let's look at the situation uh, for, for a second. Yeah. I don't think, because I don't think all listeners are, are, uh, know everything about the Supreme Court, maybe. So we have uh, the Supreme Court of the U.S. has nine judges sitting on it, and it's the highest court of the, of the United States of America. So it's very important on political debates it's the, it has the final say on a lot of things um donald trump has uh, had the chance to uh, to nominate two supreme court justices in his term in office which uh, were uh, neil gersich and brett kavanaugh who have both been uh confirmed by the u.s senate so he has two people that he was able to to nominate uh and if the senate will go ahead and start a re-election process for a Supreme Court justice um, replacing um, Bader Ginsburg. He will be the first president since Ronald Reagan, who is able to not, to to maybe bring in three Supreme Court justices justices into the Supreme Court. Mm. So that's that's a big step. And uh, I think the Democrats, or we know the Democrats, are concerned if another conservative, maybe even highly conservative. Justice will be nominated by the president and will be supported by the Republican Senate. That the Supreme Court will stay in this uh, dominant conservative majority that it will have. Then uh, I think it's safe to say that it will be uh, five, five at least conservative five, justices, yeah, three, five, three Demo more yeah. liberal leaning, and then yeah. maybe one independent, so to speak. Yeah. You know, there's even debate on that. How how much independence there is yeah and, justices, but no i think you're you're absolutely right ben and of course my my mistake is not to have sort of set the frame of course the supreme court is so important it's so political 
and you've got currently, it, you know, the best way to put it is that if Trump manages to uh, get another judge confirmed, it could be six three or at least five four, five five three or five three one. Uh, sorry, no, yeah, five three one. Um, but of course, that's a this is a perilous situation for any American liberal or American Democrat, um, as you correctly identify. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's see what will happen, uh, Lucas. What do you think of the of the situation right now? Well, I mean, given the fact that um, Justice Ginsburg was together with Sonia Sotomayor, who's also a justice who was co uh, nominated and confirmed by President Obama, um, given the fact that she's been the most liberal and most progressive of the justices on the Supreme Court, I think that the ramifications in case we will see a nomination of another justice within the term of, within the either first term or only term of President Trump, there will be dire consequences simply because now you have a, like up until now you had a court that was kind of split in half, given the fact that Justices Thomas, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Alito lean clearly towards the conservative side. And Justice Roberts, who's also the chief justice and who was nominated by President Bush Jr. Um, in the mid 2000s, he has been he's been kind of the, the pivoting person. Mm. So there have been many cases where Justice Roberts let the Republican president down, for example. This has been the case either in the uh, Bush administration, but this has also more recently been the case with um, things where, let's say this way, where conservative voters um, who really, who are these issue voters who want the conservative justices to vote only conservatively and very, like, um, how do you say, very much an originalist manner with where basically Roberts let them down, you could say. So now President Trump, in case he actually moves on to make the nomination, and according to Twitter, on September 19th, um, he will move to the nomination. Mm. We will see the situation that the court will definitely be, as Manuel just said, it's either going to be a 5-1-3 situation or even a 6-3 situation in many cases. And I think, the, I think the importance of this is just because let's look at the current political topics in the U.S. And I mean, the whole coronavirus situation is one thing. But the other thing is that regardless of whether you're a Republican or Democrat, we can agree that the whole situation around um, mail-in ballots is something that needs... Um, clarification and that needs a final ruling. As of right now, it's unclear whether you can actually vote early, vote in person, and vote as an absentee. So there are still some legal issues. And in case the Supreme Court has to decide who won the election. Um, Happened before, the, more pardon? or less. In 2000, uh, yes. we had a situation where the Supreme Court was was very very important in the in the ruling of of recounting the votes in florida which was the outcome of would uh, george w bush or uh, al gore become president of the united states so it has happened before that the, the presidential election will go in front of the court so this Absolutely. is a very important very important decision if you let me interrupt just one time i think the the case bush v gore is really great because in this situation you had the court in full assembly, so nine justices, but you also had a situation where not every justice voted the same, like, how do you say, um, there have been distance with either three or four justices. So it was really, it was a tough situation. If you, if you had this with only eight justices, you could either not get to any result, and let's be frank, the, the constitution does not say what happens then. So everything were to stay as is right now. And this is definitely something that President Trump might actually hint at when he's like, oh, guys, we deserve a third term, don't we? But I don't think that he's going to go this way. This is like if there's a nuclear option that Harry Reid has pulled for the first time in 2013 and then was yeah. kind of pulled by the Republicans um, um, since 2017, yeah. I think this would kind of be the hydrogen bomb option. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be the hydrogen bomb option. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I completely agree. But I think that, I think, yeah, that this is immensely important in, with the election. I think that's the really big, the big lasting impacts are 
twofold. Obviously, the one, the effect that it will have on any legislation proposed for the next X years if the nominee gets approved. And if the nominee gets approved or if he doesn't get approved, the situation of a tied court in the event of a contested election. That's the, re- I think you're absolutely right. I think that, I think it, it is, it is, it is truly an Octo. It is a September surprise to beat any any other October surprise. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> grim that you have to talk about the passing of such a, an amazing woman in such a yes. in such a in such a brutal way. But it really is a real spanner in the works, so to speak. But I think that I think that um, it will be really interesting to see if McConnell, you know, pick up on the point, the if right, does McConnell. How does McConnell proceed? And if I'm Trump, I've got to think, isn't it a bit wiser to try and rile up your base and say, look, dangle the conservative judge over them and say, come vote for me, come vote for me, come vote for me, come on, come come vote for me, as a sort of insurance policy against any other things that might happen come October. So you've always got that rallying cry. And then I would move then. Because worse comes to worse, even if um, he loses, the, the Republicans can then appoint a judge. But if they if they move to a vote now, okay, they might they might indeed have the numbers. So I think you need so you need four GOP senators. I think three have indicated they will not vote on a judge. But let's just say that they're able to uh, the GOP don't aren't, aren't even able to bring it to a vote on time because the Democrats filibuster or yada yada yada. Then but they're, they're probably going to try, but but the, the Republicans have a majority, right? They don't need any Democratic. It's, no, 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 but you need to, no, because, no, because if there are some GOP senators who would defect, right? Maybe. So Mikowski, Mikowski of Alaska said she would, uh, Collins, would of, not vote, yeah. Collins of Maine said she has indicated she might not, and it's probably in her interest not to, to be honest with you, or certainly to say I'll vote for it after the election. And then, of course, you've got Mitt Romney, who would love to stick two fingers up to Trump. And then the question is whether they can get one more senator. So, if you have that nominee fight, um, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure that's the politically wiser move. It could stir up the base, interestingly. But here's another little spanner in the works for you. Mark Kelly can take up his seat almost immediately after he's elected. So, the so assuming that he wins in Arizona, the Democrat Mark Kelly, the GOP therefore could only sustain three defections. Um in order to stop it to being brought to a vote, in order to advance their nominee. So you could be left in a situation where McConnell goes, McConnell does what I've just indicated to be the wiser move, and then gets, uh, well, it doesn't serve him well. It's complicated, it's interesting. I'm not sure, of course, how it's going to go. It's way too early for me to see, to guess how this could go. But pure conjecture at this point, I'm not sure it's the politically wisest move, but it could be, let's see how it happens, you know. Yeah, um, this is something where I kind of agree with you, but not fully. So I was talking to a friend today and we were thinking about what would be the smartest solution from a Republican point of view. And Mm -hmm. I mean, you were mentioning, and this is where I think that you clearly have a good point, um, whether it might be wiser for the president to be like, people, this is about um, getting another conservative justice Mm -hmm. in, and this is about riling up my base. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you have a situation where I think uh, of course, you have a lot of people who vote Republican, especially in the Bible Belt, especially like evangelicals, but also suburban people who might vote um, for the president based on who he might actually nominate for the Supreme Court. But on the, on the other hand, um, looking at my personal surrounding and the people who I got to know when I was living in New England, I do think that there's actually way more people on the Democratic side who might, might yeah, actually be riled up by this whole thing. Because um, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, definitely something where Republicans might, like many Republicans today in the inter- on the internet were kind of like, oh yeah, this is very bad, but at least we get to confirm someone else. I don't think it's that easy, first of all. Like you mentioned that completely correctly, Senator Murkowski of Alaska might not vote in favor of it. Senator um, Collins of Maine might not vote in favor of it. The thing is, you basically have th- you have three senators who may defect, and then you're still 50-50, and then the VP comes in and he breaks the tie. But at the same time, I'm not really sure whether there's going to be any 
improvement of the situation for the, for Donald Trump. So, exactly, I think exactly. I think he needs to get um, a replacement for Justice Ginsburg as quickly as possible in case he wants to win the election. But any because any other situation, any doubt, any delay in this might actually lead to um, Republicans being like. Why? Why is he delaying? Why am I going yeah. to the polls at all? Yeah. And I do you think, like, it's very interesting given the fact that the Bible Belt states and also these industrial, like the old Rust Belt states, um, these are all battlegrounds. And I do like it's very interesting that both sides. It's all about the turnout. It's all about voter turnout. And I do simply think that the Republicans cannot win on this side. I do think that the death of Senator Ginsburg gets progressive people even more out of the polls than yeah. it does Republicans. I think, Lucas, I'd, I think I think you're just completely right. I think that, like, someone said it really nicely. I think I've got two points here to make. The first is the comparison that pick up on the Ginsburg point. When Scalia died in 2016, I think that he was a really monumental figurehead judge for the conservative movement in America. I think Ginsburg plays a similar role. And I think the experience of Kavanaugh and Gorsuch and the political battles which have gone on the Trump, under the Trump administration in the Supreme Court have, I think you're exactly right, energized the political Democrats just as much as the, the Republicans. And I think, yeah, you're right, that there could be a, a, an enthusiasm deficit if he doesn't move quickly enough. And, you know, just to prove your point even more, Act Blue, so Democratic fundraising site, raised $9.2 million last night after the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? Yeah, that's how much enthusiasm, that's what they can do. And I think that, like fundamentally, it has a really, really um, a bitter impact, certainly. It's going to make this election even more bitter because the bases are going to be even more hyped up. Probably. But there was a point, I don't know if, if, if uh, it was somewhat, somewhat in there with the things that you said, but there was this point made that Republicans who are uneasy about voting for Trump, so yeah. Republicans thinking about voting for Biden, could now have a reason to vote for Trump. Certainly, but it does uh, cut both if, ways. if their you know if their perspective is if their perspective Certainly. is you know if we get a Democratic president we're going to have a more liberal Supreme Court, which is a topic. Certainly, um, but 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 I would say there is a little bit of evidence to suggest that this is not necessarily all political firm ground. First thing I'd say is, so New York Times Siena College ran a poll of Maine, Arizona, and North Carolina. Right. In every single state, Biden is trusted more to nominate a Supreme Court justice. Right. So it's 53 to 43 in Arizona. That's that's by what that's by a wider margin than he's winning uh, in the polls. Right? 59 to 37 in Maine. Again, a wider margin than by he's winning. And 47 to 44 in North Carolina. Again, by a wider margin than he's winning. It implies there are people who are saying they're going to vote for Trump. Who would actually for Biden to nom- nominate just? That's one thing. No, a good change, of course. There's not. And it's a, not a poll a about about a person. Group. And if you know, no, no. But if it's talking about, about who is on the Supreme Court, it's a talk about politics, about polit- political, about political nature. You know, it's more of do you favor a more you, liberal uh, sure. ruling on on political yeah. debates, or do you favor more conservative ruling on political debates? Sure. So people can find Joe Biden to be. A better president every day, no. but if they no, 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 like, no, 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 it's not for president. That's not, for president. That's not for, no, it's not for president. That's not. That's no, not for president. It's about who you do trust more to nominate for the Supreme Court, and every single one Biden. No, 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 but that's really fascinating. And then here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. In in Arizona, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Florida, at least twenty percent, and in states like Florida and Pennsylvania and Michigan, it's twenty five percent of Trump's vote is pro choice secular blue collar women or at least pro-choice and secular blue collar so running a rail and do you know what these do you know what, this type of voter does not like right and dave wasserman of the cook political report highlights this really nicely they're pro-choice substantially they're against repealing obamacare and they're extremely against tax cuts for wealthy americans so i'm not sure that this is necessarily fertile political terrain for trump in fact i would characterize it as both sides are now operating on a tightrope because Trump can't rail the Supreme Court issue too much because Biden can then turn around to him and say, hey, but look, you, you want to repeal healthcare or hey, by the way, you want, to do, you want to do tax cuts for wealthy Americans, blah, blah, blah. And going on the offensive there is where Biden is stronger. And especially on the pro-choice issue, I, 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 it cuts both ways. Yeah, it gives those Republicans who 
might be tempted to vote for Biden, although there are fewer of them now because there are a few undecideds. But it also means that there are some elements of the Blue Collar Coalition that Trump was successful in bringing in in 2016 that, are, that, that might not go back to him. So I, let's just wait for the evidence, right? I, always, I would say. But I'm just thinking, you know, what I've seen in the last, whatever, however long, it's not necessarily anything yet. That's all I'd say. Not necessarily anything yet. Let's just wait for the evidence, I think is my, my overarching assumption. Mm-hmm. So let's see, is there anything? Uh, so I've, I've been just checking on the, uh, on, on the news as well. So uh, there was a, there's an article posted by the New York Times just uh, today, you know, just a few hours ago, that says that, okay, there are people talking about the idea of what's called packing the court. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea of, uh, we talked about this, uh, um, Franklin uh, Roosevelt, Saying that okay, if I have a problem with the with the political yeah. uh, separation inside the court, um, yeah. I'll just increase the number of judges. So I think the idea is fifteen. Uh, could you get a political yeah as to as from to as many as fifteen justices? It says in the article. Um, and uh, the question is: Is that a political is a political background for doing it? Last time, Joe Biden was uh, asked about this. Just. Uh, Last year, uh, he said that, I'm, no, I'm not prepared yeah. to go on yeah. to that idea and try to pack the court because we will live to rue that day. So the question will be, is that just an idea of, of some people in the Democratic Party or is that a topic that will be in the main debate in the next few weeks? What are your thoughts on that? Frankly spoken, I don't think it's going to happen. So I read that too. Uh, this was published some hours ago in the Washington Post already, where they were saying, like, yeah. in case um, President Trump actually pushes through the nominee or Senator McConnell does it, then um, any President Biden, in case there is a President Biden, should um, pack the court so there would be a progressive majority. Frankly spoken, I don't think it's going to happen. Even if there was a President uh, Biden, I don't think it were to happen. First of all, you have too many. Um, you have too many Democrats in the Senate who are not really in favor of this idea. Take, for example, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who's been a senator for the Democratic Party for the last 10 years, but who has frequently voted in favor of Republican policies in case it um, helped his voters. Like, let, Let's be frank, there's a huge difference between who's a progressive or who's voting Democrat in Massachusetts and who's voting Democrat in West Virginia. There's two completely I'd different favor. political um, impacts. I think this is something uh, where those of us who are in Europe sometimes forget that just because you're aligned with the Blue Party or the Red Party does not mean that you share the same political ideals. But, but um, in summary, I don't think that packing the court would ever work. First of all, I think there'd be too much resistance from within the party. Secondly, um, there have been more than 110 justices in the United States now. There have been, I think, a total of 15 or 20 chief justices now. And they've all been the chiefs of a nine-justice court. And I don't think that anything would justify such a decision by any President Biden. I, th- I think the bait, I think you I think you're right man I think that like if you Biden is a guy of norms Biden is running the campaign of the restoration of the soul of America I think there's obviously a strong pressure on the democratic progressive wing to pack the court or to to react strongly against this I think you I think your basic instinct's right I think the fundamental thing also guys we're missing is what if um I've just seen uh, a senator from Missouri Josh Hawley firebrand on the right of the party has said he'll only vote for a nominee if that nominee will explicitly overturn Rovers Wade. Think about this for a second though. Mitt Romney, uh, Senator Collins and Lisa Murkowski have all said they wouldn't and it's also possibly possible uh, wouldn't vote for someone who will overturn Rovers Wade. It's also possible that one could join them. So maybe there's an underrated angle here we haven't even discussed which is that beyond the packing does, does Trump's nominee even get nominated? I mean, is it is it is it a given? I'm not I'm not sure. I, I, I threw it out there to be dissected, but it's to me it's not necessarily yet a given 
he'll be nominated. And therefore, the discussion, as as Lucas is is, is quite correctly identified already, about packing the court seems to me not just yet. Do you know what I mean? I think everyone needs to sort of take hold on, just let, take stock. Let's let's look at the, the fundamentals. And I think yeah, not just yet would be my my opinion. There's something to throw out there. Yeah, it's all it's all pretty fresh. I mean, this is just this yeah. is just hours it's twenty-four into hours happening, older. and um, we, you know, <laughs> there's so much that can still happen. Uh, the question will be how this can affect the presidential election. So let's mm. talk about that a bit. Uh, so as we as we know, um, we talked about this before in many polls. Uh, Joe Biden has a has a strong lead on on President Trump. Yeah, uh, roughly around six or seven points, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So it's yep. around 50 to 43 or 44 percent in uh, in the polls nationally. But looking at the background battleground states, uh, and we've heard numbers that uh, Arizona is leaning very um, hardly to to the Democrats this time, which is surprising. But I think it's also made up because of made up because of uh, strong candidates for the Senate running in Arizona. Absolutely. Mark uh, Kelly for, is a great candidate. The, for Democratic yeah. Party. What? Yeah. Mark Kelly is a fantastic candidate. You're absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely. He's good good speaker, has good uh, yeah. good appearance. Air um, Force pilot, astronaut. Yeah. Numbers is where, it's, where it might get uh, interesting again is Florida. I think the yeah. the lead of Biden is shrinking there. So Florida is up for grabs again. It's a battleground state uh, that Trump needs to win. He needs yeah. to win. The, yeah. the first thing I thought about when um, starting into this into this election campaign was, you know, if, if Trump does not manage to win Florida again, yeah, he's out. I don't he's see him. Good. I don't see him yeah. coping those those uh, those votes. I think, I think it's twenty nine. Yeah, twenty nine in, in Florida. Tw- twenty nine votes for the electoral yeah. college, and you need to find a place where you can get those many votes if you don't win Florida. So that's some that's a state he absolutely needs to win. Absolutely. And so let's talk on that. And to, with that, we have the uh, the press memo saying that uh, Mayor Bloomberg, or former Mayor Bloomberg, said that he will donate 100 million US dollars <laughs> to the Biden campaign for yeah. uh, advertisement yeah. in Florida. Just Florida. 100 million US dollars for Florida because of the importance it has there. Yeah. Just, just, like, just on that really quick note of just context, guys. Hillary Clinton... Right in August in 2016, raised 123 million dollars for her entire campaign. Bloomberg is now shilling out almost what Hillary earned in a month on one state. It's incredible money. It's incredible money. Um, let's see how it works. But for you, Ben, you're basically you're exactly right. Uh, Florida has a Titan. Florida is Florida. You know, it's it's so <laughs> the old the old uh, the old adage of democratic bedwetting is totally tr- totally true. I would say to my fellow Democrats, uh, don't worry, Florida is Florida. It's always going to be tight. Obama won it by 0.8. But no, you're exactly right. I think Biden's average lead going to 538 stands at something like 2%. And he's at 48. The worrying thing for the Biden camp is that they seem to have a problem, especially with the Cuban-American vote, especially with the Venezuelan vote. They seem to be underperforming with Hillary Clinton, vis-a-vis Hillary Clinton. Good news for Biden is that he seems to be offsetting that loss with um, outsized margins with um, seniors. And he seems to also have realized his weakness and has seemed to me to be starting to be reaching out to Puerto Rican, his, the Puerto Rican Hispanic vote. That'd be very interesting. But yes, Florida is tighter. There was a poll came out at uh, the start of the week, a, a rated pollster, Monmouth poll, that said that Trump, that Biden was up five, around 50. That's an incredible poll. Uh, for Biden, that's a really great result to be up that much. It's probably not going to be that much. But yeah, Florida is tighter. Um, and Ben, you're exactly right. There's no path to victory for a Republican without Florida. I don't think there are many. I, I mean, you have to go back a long way to find a, a Republican president who won without Florida. Um, so yeah, that adds another lovely little edge to the whole race is the, uh, is, is the contest in Florida. So you're still you you are still confident that uh, Biden can win Florida. I mean, he's all he's still in front. He's still in front. He's still in front. He's still in front. I'm not sure if he'll win it. I'm not confident he'll win it, but he is still currently in front. Um, but I, 
and that wasn't really true of Hillary Clinton. Uh, but then again, it was also wasn't really true of Obama. Obama was behind Romney, and many polls have stopped polling in Florida in 2012. So I don't know. It's Florida. I would love more good quality polls out of Florida and Pennsylvania for that matter. But yeah, it's super tight right now. I think Manuel is making a really good point about the Cuban Americans. Um, Benjamin, when you look at the um, look at the Latino vote or Latinx vote, I think it's in a more progressive uh, manner. And it's basically um, in 2016, Donald Trump accrued total support of around about 28% um, among Latinos. Um, this has been polled by Quintilian, which um, tends to be a bit more um, Quinnipiac, which tends to be a bit more towards the conservative side. But even if you take into account the fact that they might be um, biased in favor of President Trump, according to the same poll that they're conducting now that they conducted two weeks ago, President Trump was up 8%. He's now at a 36% approval rate um, or voting rate among Hispanic Americans. And this is clearly better than John McCain. This is clearly better than Mitt Romney was. And I think, as you say, it's far from over, first of all. And secondly, um, it's all depending on Florida. So I have to say the last time Florida flipped, I think, five or six times at night. Um, <laughs> and I, I do think, uh, like, I was, I was talking to a friend of mine who's way more of an expert in this, who's a political scientist. He's like, in this time, it will be clear. It will be clearer who will win Florida but he cannot say who it will be. So um, yeah. instead of instead of Florida answer. changing colors and CNN five times in that and Wolf Blitzer um, getting just as crazy as the audience, um, I do think that we're gonna see a clear vote. And frankly spoken, I do think that the chances for President Trump are not that bad. I think um, right now it looks kind of kind of bad, bad. for um, especially It looks like, really bad on it. Yeah, like when, when, when you look polling, at- on the on the electoral college has Biden up to 269, so one vote away from winning. Of course, of course, those are just polls and prognoses, yeah. like, but that's something that you need to fight with. And having battleground states like, like if you're Arizona, and North Carolina, that you would count as Republican, absolutely. and having lost Pennsylvania in all of the polls yeah. that I've seen like, so far. Yeah, like it's if, really if you look at Trump, it's really hard. If, if you look at the real clear politics, no toss up map um, as a Republican. He might just get cardiac arrest. Um, President Trump stands at 185 votes, as opposed to um, former Vice President Biden's 353 votes. And you look at the map, there's Michigan is blue, Wisconsin is blue, Pennsylvania is blue, Florida is blue. I don't know whether this is going to happen, but frankly spoken, the uh, the Republican platform also has seen better times. Like, um, I oh, would yeah. say that I... Oh, yeah. I would say that there have been even worse times, but right now, I don't think that the Republicans find the right solution or the right answer to many issues that people yes. um, apparently have. I don't say that these are real issues, but let's, let's be frank, the whole identity politics issue and the whole question of how to uh, treat um, people with minority backgrounds, this is typically something where if you were to talk to someone who does not know about current politics and you just tell him does the republican platform appeal to minorities typically it should immigrants should actually be very uh, supportive of the republican agenda because yes, if agree. you if you boil it down to the essence it's like if you work hard you're going to earn a lot and despite this most migrants or most second generation migrants do not uh, vote trump and yeah. i think like could you have imagined, both of you, could you have imagined four years ago that in 2020 we would talk about, that's not a question of if, but just when Texas might turn blue? Uh, I, right. I could be, yeah, man, you, you're exactly right. And I was reminded of this, this that the fact is that like in 2016, um, Arizona was won by a Republican by 3% and it had two Republican senators, right? And in 2020, it may just go to a Democrat president by 3% and have two Democrat senators. I, mean, I think you're exactly right. I think that the, the incredible realignment that we might just be seeing is incredible. Texas, that is just, I would love to see a really high quality come out, poll, poll out of Texas. I would love to see what's going on in Texas because I've seen a few polls from congressional districts and it's, men, it's mental, it's mental. 
And if the midterms are anything to go by, that's also mental. And I'll add another mental here. The NRCC, so the uh, Congressional Campaign Committee for the Republicans, are pulling advertising two weeks out from uh, um, in-person voting on November 3rd. So there will be no Houston TV advertising. Houston is obviously crucial for Texas. That That's eye-dropping. That's really interesting. I think, but to the overall state of the race, the venue, you're right, I think it, it's not great for Trump. And every day that it's not great for Trump, the next day becomes even more not great for Trump because you have less and less time to turn it around. Um, and I think that Biden has a quite clearly, obviously seems to have quite a stable and, and uh, durable lead in Wisconsin and Michigan and in Arizona. And, and he keeps up the mistakes. I think the, the biggest, the yeah. best thing you can say about Joe Biden is that he really, you know, he can say he's, he does slow campaigning, yeah. but my guess is that is all strategy to not make mistakes. You know, yeah. the, the less you speak, the, yeah. exactly. the more you, you just smile exactly. and shake hands, the less you can do, you can make any mistakes. You have no a lead malarkey. right now. People, no you know, people are motivated to vote for you because they want to get rid of the other guy. I mean, those are also the polls. A lot of voters said they, they want Trump gone. They, they're not big fans of Biden, yeah. per se, but they want yeah, Trump yeah, gone. Yeah. And in that situation, it's really smart. Just be be more reserved and just wait it out and do not make any mistakes. And I think Biden is being very, very smart about this. Very smart. I, I completely agree. And I think that's what's got him to the position that he is in. And I think if you look at the 16 state, the Clinton 16 states, which could have flipped, uh, Nevada looks good for Biden. New Hampshire looks good for Biden. Maine second, which went to Trump, obviously, now looks good for Biden. And uh, Minnesota also looks good for Biden. So remember, all Biden has to do is thrip, flip three of those states to Trump won, keep hold of the 2016 map, he wins. So, I, I mean, like, fundamentally, right now, from my vantage point, this could obviously change so much in a week. But like, Biden's in a good position. You yes. want to be, I mean, and let's also think about this, guys. This is a challenger. I mean, how many challengers have beaten the incumbent? It's, I mean, this is it's a, it's a good position to be. He's at 50. What is he? Real clear promise. It has him what like so 50.3 in the uh, in the polling average. It's a good position to be for a challenger. It's incredible. So yeah. no, I think, yeah. So I think good overall for Biden. But Ben, you, you played absolutely right. He's got to wind down the clock. He's got to keep it disciplined. And the campaign so far, I think, has shown that they have that discipline. And they have that now um, to be able to get ahead of um, events that could be difficult. But we'll obviously only know if they were successful November 3rd, post, post November 3rd. But on the point about Florida. Will we know on really November 3rd with all, the, with all the absentee voting? That's the question Because as well. with Florida, yeah, this is, the, this is where Florida is going to really, really, I think Florida will, it may just be the most consequential state race President, state race, present race ever, uh, really ever. Here's why. Florida counts on the night. They, they, they will have the count by the night's end. We'll know if Biden or Trump won Florida. If it's tight and then Trump wins and, you know, and Trump wins, but then a week later, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and even Arizona move into the Biden column, it's so easy for Trump to say, hey, the election was stolen from me, you know? So, so, so I, I, Florida, if Biden come in a decisive victory in Florida, that not only, you know, we're not talking, you know, we're not talking incredible masses. We're here, we're just talking Florida, you know, two points or something. If he doesn't win in Florida, that really could have an outsized effect on everything else. So it is the most important state. Probably the most important state Probably the most, yeah, probably the most important state race for president. Yeah, it's in my memory. Yeah, incredibly important. Yeah, it's, it's very, like uh, you're absolutely right. I think it's an uphill battle for the incumbent. On the other hand, you were asking the, you know, the very clear question, um, who was an incumbent who lost? And I can tell you, Jimmy Carter. Um, Jimmy Carter lost in a landslide, yep. in a freaking yep. landslide. And quick, quick, but a quick question for you. Quick question for you. Which state did he not lose? Oh, I do not know. I think Jimmy Carter. He was lost. Okay. Georgia, Massachusetts. Probably. He had his own state close, and close. the one of his running mate, right? Um, Rhode Island. Exactly no, no, no. It is. It is the wonderful state of Minnesota. 
Oh, yeah. which has been Democrat. His running mate was from Minnesota, right? I think that was it. I think so. Vice president. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, with, what I want to say is, I mean, obviously the whole uh, Reagan era was a different one. First of all, you had yeah. him being the oldest president back then, uh, yeah. just dethroning Jimmy Carter, who actually started yeah. the race looking not that bad. Yeah, and then cool. you also had his VP, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, just um, taking over a third consecutive term for Republicans against Walter, not Walter Munder. Uh, that was, who's that, a former... The former yeah. former governor of Massachusetts, Dukakis, yeah. Mike Dukakis, yeah. Um, so what I have to say, when it comes to the to the implications or the standing that we have now, some 51, 52 days ahead of the election, first of all, I, I still don't think that polling um, will give us a definitive answer on what's going to happen. Um, you remember two months ahead of the election, um, on September 8th, I was checking the, I was checking 538 and they gave uh, President Trump only a 34% chance. And now keep in mind that um, at the election day in 2016, um, former, uh, former Foreign Secretary Clinton had a chance of 72%. So first of all, I do think that there's always the yeah. chance that all the polling does not really work out. Um, especially like if, if you look into the details and the two of you were saying you want to see good polls and when you look into the polling like we always look at the average polling but when you look at the individual polls you've conservative pollsters um, such as Fox News for example who even said um, just a month ago that Biden actually was ahead in Texas now why do they say that because they they pursue an agenda they obviously try to they obviously try to indicate towards Republicans, don't stay at home, go out, go get the vote. Um, so I still do not really um, believe that polling alone will tell us who's going to win, number one. But number two, I do think that, with, like, last times, the RNC and DNC, the conventions, clearly gave either party just a blip up when it happened. This time, not so much. This might be because yep. it's not in person. So the only thing that's separating us from the election are, on one hand, three presidential debates, one vice presidential debate, and maybe an October surprise. Now, as you already mentioned, uh, Manuel, we got a September surprise. Now, I do still think that there might be more surprises to come, um, and I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're not favoring President Trump because frankly spoken, everyone knows everything about this man, except for the tax returns, obviously. But Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right. Quite but, right. Um, and there's actually a really fun tweet by Lindsey Graham, who is um, tweeting yeah, at yeah, his opponent, who's yeah. like, it's been five days, where are your tax returns? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To which the opponent was like, it's been five years, where are President Trump's tax returns? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't, I completely, no, yeah, no, I think, yeah, it'll be, I see uh, Bill Barr. Um, Bill Barr. There's, there's, yeah. there's, 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 he might plant something. I think you're yeah, right. he, he's a trooper for the president. He definitely oh, yes. is. Yes. <laughs> um, but but, but yeah. I do have to say, um, what I'm just trying to convey is the fact that I do think that the debates are not going to be that good for um, Biden. Frankly spoken, um, I, don't, I think that Joe Biden's a really smart man. And I do have to say that when you look at when you look at the policy history he had towards the, um, in the time he was in the Senate, this has actually been quite a stringent thing. He's never been a flip flopper in many things, which um, which is something that might actually hurt him because he was also not a flip flopper in civil rights in the seventies to the nineties. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. But th there's just one issue that I do have, and this is, you remember this time when he was like, uh, we choose truth over facts, or black, yeah. chil black children can just be as smart as, no, was it poor children can just be as smart as white children, um, things like this. And obviously, this is something that can happen to anyone. And let's be frank, there's so many, so many bloopers that happen during yeah. um, Trump yeah, campaigns. Yeah, right. But the difference is, when you vote for President Trump, you know what you're getting. You're getting entertainment. People who vote for um, Biden, I do think, um, have more of this point of view that they know that he's better for America. I'm not really sure how that will translate in case uh, Joe Biden's actually not doing as well in the um, debates as people expect yeah. from. But 
this is the, the caveat of the whole thing. We don't really know what to expect from it. It was clear that um, Hillary Clinton would be more calm in the debates. It was clear that Donald Trump would be the attacker in the debates, yeah. kind of. And yeah. right now, I could, like, if I was if I was a political advisor to Joe Biden, I could not really say how to behave in the debates. Because on yeah. one hand, President right. Trump will be 100% on attack, but there's also so much stuff that yeah. can be shot towards, um, towards Joe Biden that might not be towards his advantage. I, th I think, yeah, I think the... I think the debates, I will take a slightly contrarian view, I think Biden had a very good debate against, or a good debate at least, against Sanders one-on-one, -on -one. didn't debate well in a group, many different reasons for that. I think the first debate will be very indicative. Most presidents haven't tended to do well in their first debate for some reason. Romney obviously, Romney obviously bettered Obama in the first one. Um, Bush got bested by Kerry. Clinton too, 96, 92. Uh, my feeling is, and Reagan, it goes back to Reagan as well. My feeling is Trump will not like being debated. And my feeling is that Biden may come away looking better. But I think your big thing is there. There are two things here. Number one, does Biden make a gaffe? And if he makes a gaffe, it fits into a wider narrative about Biden. And then that, that hurts. Then the wider narrative hurts. And then the second thing I'd say, is that um, expectations have been set so low for Biden that all he needs to do is just turn up and do a good job, then and he will have passed. And the final thing I will say is Hillary Clinton won all three debates but lost the election. John Kerry won all three debates but lost the election. Like, and so I'm not sure necessarily the impact but it could certainly have an impact on the narrative and that could have an impact on the race. But let's wait and see. Well, you, I, I would say you don't win with the debate, but you can lose with the debate. I think exactly. Uh, remembering Dukakis, who definitely lost uh, the run against uh, Bush Sr. With the, with the TV debates and his, uh, well, unfortunate answers at the time to, to a broader audience. But I think, uh, you know, let's, let's wait and see. I'm, I'm yeah. you know, I'm psyched. I can talk about this all day, every day. I think this is something, this is historic, what we're wit witnessing here, as are all presidential elections in their own mind. Um, but we will have a lot to talk about. Let's see how the situation with the Supreme Court and possible nominations will move um, in the next few weeks coming up to the election. I think we should stay on it and let's keep talking about that. What do Absolutely. you think, Lucas? I absolutely agree with uh, what the two of you said, and I think uh, there's been one topic that we have not been talking about today, and this is the role of the VP picks. Now, yeah. given the fact that you know who Mike Pence is, and everyone basically knows who Mike Pence is, being the kind of counter set off for more conservative voters who might not have been in favor of President Trump prior to him picking them, on the other side, you have uh, with Kamala Harris, someone who I think might not just help Joe Biden in the long run. And this is just one thing, one last thing, where I think the, the presidential election is lost or won in small states, uh, it's won in small battles. For example, like you have 12 swing states at the moment. And I just give one last example. And this is um, look at environmental policy. Environmental policy in the swing states is always labor policy. And look at Pennsylvania, where fracking actually brought down the unemployment numbers. And this brought a lot of people on the Republican side. And then, for example, you have Kamala Harris, who's like in favor of complete ban on fracking. So I think what's going to be interesting, and this is also where it comes back to the um, decision on how to handle the death of Justice Ginsburg, Joe Biden always had the issue that the left side of the party is kind of kind of trying to nudge him towards more left um, things like the Hyde Amendment or fracking, as I mentioned before. And I, I think given the fact that Donald Trump is now the one who can act um, and who now has the authority to make the first step, it's going to be kind of tough for um, Joe Biden to make all the right steps to keep everyone in line. And this means keeping the people who want a very progressive justice in line, but also people who would like to see a more balanced Supreme Court. There are a lot of Democrats 
we're not just in favor of someone who's 100% progressive, but who's more of a 60, 40, 70, 30 guy or mad mm. person. Mm. I would love to spend a whole episode just talking about Kamala Harris and Mike Pence, that debate. Right. That is going to be super interesting. There yeah, was gonna... supposed to be a VP candidate debate, right? Yeah, it's October 7th. Yeah. I think. Yes. October yeah, 7th. so let's pick that up and see how they do on that okay. and then put them into focus in an episode talking about the, uh, the Vice President uh, Pence and Vice Presidential nominee uh, Kamala Harris, who is said to be, you know, maybe the front runner, if, if Joe Biden is successful becoming president of the US, she might be the front runner for the uh, presidential elections in 2024. So we will talk about her a lot, I'm sure, in the, in, in the next few years. Even if Joe Biden might lose, she might be a candidate in 2024. So this is something that's going to be on our radar for a long time, I think. All right. So there was a lot. There was a lot to talk about again. I think uh, we've, we've managed to make it a very interesting conversation for everyone listening. Uh, Lucas, thank you again for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, I know you have a busy me. day. Yeah, <laughs> always, always. We're sure we're going to have you here again. And uh, Manny, to you as well, thank you for all the insights. My absolute pleasure. Yeah, as always. Perfect. Uh, because of the uh, death of uh, Mrs. Uh, Beta Ginsburg, yeah. this episode we will use as the outro music um, Amazing Grace. And to think of, of uh, a strong woman sitting on the Supreme Court for 27 years, which is just such a long time and had been very impactful, uh, very, very successful in her work for the, for the US, uh, United States. So this is something that we want to show with, with which we want to show respect. And um, I hope that um, the topic will become not something of uh, a big political fight washing it probably will be but maybe we'll be surprised you know it's always good to see democracy working in a in a honorable manner so let's see how this will turn out but we will keep informed and we will inform our listeners for the future so thank you again lucas posh former thank chairman you. of the uh, young transatlantic initiative in germany thank you emmanuel jensen our thank polls you. expert and uh, our ever dear friend my name is benjamin welling and I'm, I'll say good day, good night, uh, take care, stay healthy, and get through corona as best as you can. Let's yep. hear each other soon. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Do you have any regrets? I, I do think that I was born on, under a very bright star because you think of, of my life, I got out of law school. I have top grades. No law firm in the city of New York will hire me. I end up teaching. As I said before, they, they gave me time to devote to the movement for evening out the rights of women and men. I was not nominated to a vacancy on the Second Circuit. Instead, I was nominated to a vacancy on the D.C. Circuit. Much better place for me to be because the D.C. Circuit decides a lot of very important questions involving um, what's going on in our government. So, I'll tell you what Justice O'Connor once said to me. She said, suppose we had been, we had come of age at a time when women lawyers were welcome at the bar. You know what? Today we would be retired partners from some large law firm. But because that was, route was not open to us, we had to find another way, and we both end up on the United States Supreme Supreme Court.